I think you all saw me this morning. Uh, hi, how's everyone doing? Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is uh, the first time I'm giving a talk as a director of Ruby Central, and we'll get into that. But I um, have a few personal updates to talk about before we get too far, far into it. Um, this is going to get real emotional. Um, I, I'm so happy to be here. So just to introduce myself, my name is Penelope. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm trans, and I'm a woman. And I really couldn't have done this uh, without the Ruby community. Um, I've been coming to these conferences since 2013. Uh, I owe my career, many of my best friendships, uh, and so much of my life to the folks in this room and beyond. Um, and I'm just I'm so proud to be able to stand here in front of you today and say this. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I'm also uh, director of Ruby Central now. Uh, I will be helping organize uh, this conference and all of the conferences going forward. Uh, I will be the program chair for RailsConf. Uh, so please uh, submit a talk to RailsConf. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, I'm no longer an RSpec maintainer. I uh, officially retired uh, from doing that. Uh, with taking on these additional responsibilities, it just wasn't something I was able to keep uh, doing. Um, and I want to say thank you uh, to John Rowe, who takes over now as the lead maintainer of RSpec, uh, and Myron Marston, Andy Linderman, and David Chalimsky, who really took the time to teach me how to work on the framework uh, and really actually helped me become uh, the Ruby developer I am today. Uh, So Ruby format is going to be my open source focus for the next while, and that's the purpose of this talk. Uh, so let's get into it. What is Ruby format? Well, uh, for the last couple of years, I've been programming not just in Ruby, but also I've been doing a lot of Go. And if you've ever worked in Go, you've probably encountered the Go format tool. What Go format does is it allows you to sort of make any change you want to a file, and as the like formatting, you can mess it up in any way that you want, basically, and just save the file. And when you do so, the code will just snap into place. So here I have some like garbage indentation. I save the file and fix a syntax error, and I think all the code just eventually will snap in. Yeah, you can see it sort of fixes the indentation automatically. But also what's really important is this happens super, super quickly. The file that I was editing there was about 2,000 lines of code, and Go format is executing in around 25 milliseconds. To give you some idea, your typical computer screen refreshes once every 16 milliseconds, so this is barely two screen refreshes. And, like, I can't not know this now. This is, to me, like, the existence of this tool in Go um, is just amazing. It makes working with the code feel great. And we don't have something like that in Ruby today. And so I set out to build it. I set out to build the equivalent sort of class of tool, a very, very fast code formatter in Ruby. So what this basically means is that we take source code in, the program runs, and the output is like better formatted source code, consistent, uh, and it should execute very quickly. Um, Go format has no uh, formatting related configuration options, and neither will Ruby format when it's done. Uh, this is to just sort of help basically ensure speed of execution and consistency of style, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the philosophy behind that versus why 
uh, RuboCop has all of the configuration flags in this talk. Um, Ruby format will behave very much like a Unix tool. It is designed to be very singular, um, consume input from standard in or file names, write to standard out or write files in place, you know, very, very simple behaviors. It also will never be distributed as a gem. And this is something that uh, I've seen some confusion around. Um, the tool is reliant on so many like binary and system pieces that the kind of like project level isolation that we use gems for just doesn't make sense for a tool like this. There's no, there's no way uh, for me to efficiently distribute Ruby format as a gem. Uh, and so that's just not going to happen. Um, in terms of development cycle, it's, I'm at least six months away, uh, maybe more, and uh, I will sort of be tweeting updates. Uh, I'm Penelope Zone on Twitter if you want to find out when it's ready. So like, I could, I could finish here. That's, that's it, that's my tool, that's what it does. Uh, but instead, I'd kind of like to get into like, the why am I doing this? Uh, this is a really hard problem to solve, uh, and I'm going at it in possibly the hardest way. Um, and to talk about it, I kind of want to talk about this idea of principle or trade-offs. So like, if you were to imagine you're someone whose job it is to like craft beautiful handmade pieces of furniture that can last for generations and be passed down uh, between members of a family, right? Like you're probably going to err on the side of being slow and building things that are incredibly sturdy and carefully thought out and sort of have all of these properties of craft around what you're building. And you may come to believe, right, that this is like the correct and good way to build furniture. And I think all of us would love to own uh, a craftsman piece of furniture, but what's much more common is that we go to Ikea and we buy like very, very cheap furniture, right, that can be assembled quickly, uh, but isn't durable at all. I mean, if you've ever tried to move house with Ikea furniture, you know that we have the opposite properties. But like, it's still good, right? Like, I don't think anyone would in their right mind say that Ikea is objectively bad, right? And so we have a trade-off here. There's like a tension between these sort of two ideas of what we want and what the purpose of the thing is for. There's principles underlying the decision making. To come to software, right, we could also sort of talk about this as a principle, the idea that TDD results in better code. If you had asked me uh, what I thought about this statement three or four years ago, I would have told you this is absolutely true and people who don't do TDD are bad. If you follow me on the internet, you'll know that recently I went on a podcast where I ranted for an hour with uh, Betsy Heibel, Noel Rappin, uh, and Avdi Grimm about why TDD is not good. Uh, or at least very hard to teach and very hard to do right and can result in more damage than use. Um, and so like, this is also not objectively true, right? This is a principle, sometimes it applies, sometimes it doesn't apply. And what we're really talking about here is like discussion of trade-offs. Like what are the trade-offs that we want to accept in order to build uh, what we're building? And so, when I was writing this talk, I realized that what makes Ruby format different to all of the other tools uh, that are out there, not just technically, but from a sort of higher level perspective, is that it is born of like my very specific brand of CareMad. And um, like I've tried to boil that down into the principles that I'm using to build Ruby format. And so when I was writing this talk, the best that I could sort of distill them down into pithy statements that fit on a slide is do one thing well, correctness beats simplicity, and speed is needed at any cost. Uh, and I'm gonna explore what these principles mean to me uh, in the context of some of the other th tools that you might have seen. So let's start by talking about do one thing well, 
And to sort of frame this in context, we're going to talk a little bit about Rubocop. Uh, is anyone from the Rubocop team in the room? No, this isn't like a, this isn't a like, I'm about to dunk on you. I like, in fact, like, look, this is the next slide. <laughs> like, like um, I really, like, I have definitely been guilty of getting mad at Rubocop and saying mean things about it, and I kind of want to apologize for that. Like, it's a good tool, and I think talking about it in this context of principle uh, makes it clear why. So, like, if you go to the uh, Rubocop documentation website, these are, like, all of the categories of cops that they have, right? Because uh, Rubocop can do a lot of stuff. It can do formatting, metrics, linting, et cetera. And this is not really like seven rings that overlap like this. This is a seven-dimensional Venn diagram. This, this, by the way, is a rotationally symmetric seven-dimensional Venn diagram. I just wasn't going to like put all the text in all the boxes. It's too much effort. Um, so imagine this blob, not these rings, but this kind of applies, right? So like Rubocock can do all of these things, and it can do them pretty well, um, but like. Ruby format is only doing formatting. We literally only care about this one specific slice. And because of that, I can sort of like focus really hard and sweat the details and work out exactly how to get like really, really nice Ruby formatting going. Um, Rubocop is infinitely configurable, and that kind of, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, it kind of means that you as a team have to decide which configurations you value. Um, and to talk about that a little bit more, I'm gonna do my level best to hand over to Justin via lightning talk from LA. Cool, uh, that's not gonna work. Uh, so we'll, <laughs> we'll skip two minutes of Justin talking and I'll have to fill in. Um, so at uh, RubyConf in LA, Justin uh, announced a tool called Standard. Standard is uh, Rubocop with a like pre-baked configuration that sort of represents what Justin and the folks over at Testable believe is sort of like a good out of the box configuration for most Ruby teams. Justin's conceit is roughly that for most teams, having the sort of like discussion about which pieces of Rubocop configuration do and don't make sense for them uh, consumes more time than it is valuable. And so he's trying to have like the meta yak shave one last time uh, and then just like be configured forever. Um, I was gonna cut in halfway through Justin's talk and ask the question, uh, how many folks in this room use Rub Rubocop and have a significantly different configuration from the Rubocop out of the box defaults? Yep, that's like most of you. <laughs> Um, this, is so, this is so unsurprising to me. I think everyone finds at least one thing, if not many, in the Rubicop defaults they don't like. Um, and this is like part of what I'm driving uh, with the effort in Ruby format, is to try and come up with a sort of like formatting solution that is palatable to everyone, uh, even if it's not everyone's favorite. Um, I was gonna play a bunch more of Justin, uh, but we don't have audio through the laptop, so I'll just summarize it by saying it finished with Aaron wearing his burger hat and describing standard as Rubicop the good parts. <laughs> uh, Aaron is wearing the same burger hat, which I assume is an endorsement that uh, Ruby format is a good tool. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, so Ruby format like literally is a different the point I'm trying to make here is that Ruby format is literally a different class of tool. It is designed to do something entirely different. If you go to the Rubocop uh, page, there's just like a list of all of these configuration options. And the sort of conceit of this doing one thing well idea is that the Rubocop team has to support ev every and any possible combination of those and produce something useful. Um, and that's really hard. Like, once you have customizable software and like code format, like that just becomes infinitely hard to build something that people can appreciate. So when I talk about doing one thing well, what I really mean is that like configuration implies doing multiple things, right? 
if you have different formatting options, you no longer really have a singular auto formatter, you have a category of auto formatters you can compose together. And like you have to support every possible combination of them, which I have no interest in doing. This is a hard enough problem to solve on its own. So Ruby format supports one consistent style. Uh, you will not be able to change it, uh, but I'm going to try and make it so that everyone kind of likes it. To give you just like one example of what this looks like, um, imagine you have this piece of Ruby, right? And I very deliberately not indented it here in this example, just so you can take in what we're doing. We have an if state. We have an if statement. We assign the result into a local variable. The two arms call a method. There are a couple of ways you can indent this, right? You can indent it like this, or you can indent it like this. There are others, but these are like two alternatives. And the same thing is true with like string literals where you're broken over multiple lines, right? Uh, most people would either indent it like this or like this. And so like, what's the answer, right? If you're building one singular Ruby auto formatting style, what do you do? Well, where we ended up is that Ruby format will always indent two to the relative parent. And there's a reason for this. We had to build special case logic to find uh, where to anchor to if we didn't do this. It literally makes the auto formatter simpler to not push things all the way in. And so Ruby format will prefer this and this over the other style that I showed is possible, right? And like, again, this is a trade-off, but when we think about doing one thing well, it's sweating these kind of tiny, tiny details that's so important to me. Like, I'm probably the angriest person in this room about Ruby formatting, believe me. Um, and like, I've spending so much time just thinking about what does it actually mean and what does good Ruby look like? So that's, that's doing one thing well. Um, the next principle I wanna talk about is correctness beating simplicity. Um, and to talk about it, I wanna ask you the question, like, how do you parse Ruby? How do you take a like, file of Ruby source code and build a data structure that lets you understand what the structure of the program is? Well, if you Google this, literally the first result is this gem called parser, uh, which like, seems like an excellent result, right? Uh, and this is, this is uh, the white quark parser. Um, this parser or a variant of it is used by uh, Rubicop and GitHub for their Ruby syntax highlighting and uh, the Sorbet team re-implemented a re-implementation of this in C++. Uh, the person from the Sorbet team at the front of the room is laughing. Um, <laughs> uh, and here's the thing. The output of this parser is great. Um, it's really, really easy to deal with. Um, it's super cool. So like, say you have a program where you like, just have a function call with no arguments. The output looks like this. Thank you, Sorbet team, for making it easy to call your parser from the command line. Um, and if you add a parenthesis with a single argument, like, the thing that changes is the args node, and you get an integer with a value equal to one in it. So then you go and read the documentation for the white quark parser, and there's this whole section titled compatibility with MRI. And I was reading this, and I was reading this, and I was like, okay, 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 and then they have this section. Uh, basically, it's impossible to build a Ruby parser that's completely compatible with the one that ships with MRI, because they change it all the time, and so like, the folks who build this tool just don't even try. They're, they're doing a good job, but they like, literally state, it is impossible that this will be completely correct for all Ruby programs. And that's fair. It would be very hard for them to do that. And like, for 99% of Ruby programs, this will never ever be a problem. Like, the white quark parser is good enough to deal with almost all of the Ruby code you will ever write. But it's that almost that really gets me. Um, because the thing is, if I'm building an auto formatter, a program that consumes your code, changes it, and spits new code back out, if the parser I'm using isn't a Ruby parser, there is a non-zero probability I could meaningfully change the behavior of your program, and 
I no, because like the worst results of that could be like I drop your database or something, and like I don't I don't want no. Um, so the other way that you can parse Ruby is with a tool called Ripper. Ripper is a piece of the Ruby standard library which compiles the parser built into the Ruby implementation uh, as a like alternate library available to Ruby. Um, this, and that seems great, right? Like it's the actual Ruby parser and it's in the standard library. I don't even need a gem. Of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch in software. There are some very distinct disadvantages to doing this. So one of them is that you have to boot a Ruby interpreter. Um, I know that we're sort of talking uh, about a very small amount of time here, but I'll show you later why that's a problem. With the, the tool the Sorbet folks wrote, they can parse millions of lines of code in seconds. Can't do that with Ruby. It's just not possible. Um, running Ruby is slower than not running Ruby, unfortunately. Uh, but like, speed alone is something we can solve. The problem is that Ripper's output is nowhere near as nice as the output of a white quark parser to work with. And I'll show you an example. So if we take that same uh, program, uh, this is the output for just a zero argument method call. You have a V call, okay, that's our function call type. We have ident A, that seems fine. But if we change it back to that program where we pass an argument, um, everything changes. Uh, it changes from v call to method add arg. The call type actually changes from v call to f call. Uh, there's this arg paren thing, then arg. Like, there's so much extra stuff here. And this happens everywhere in Ripper. Anytime you change, like, a small thing, it sends you down a completely different parse tree path. And there is a good reason for this, like, due to how Ruby is implemented, but uh, I don't have time to get into that now. So, we have an accurate parser, but its output is kind of painful. Ruby format uses Ripper to ensure compatibility with whatever program you're building, and honestly, this is where all of the time in building Ruby format is going, is working out how to deal with Ripper correctly. Um, if I had used the white quark parser, I would be done. Like, we would have a Ruby auto formatter, but also, uh, it wouldn't be completely and totally correct, and I would be sad. Um, I have this weird plan to like extract Ripper from like from being directly coupled to the Ruby interpreter eventually, but I'm also not going to get into that now. That could be another complete 45-minute talk. Um, so here's what I'm saying. I'm very glad that Sorbet and Rubicop exist and are done and are shipped and did not use Ripper um, to build this, because they probably would have still be building their parsers out. Um, but I just can't. For Ruby format, it, it needs to be correct, and this is how we achieve that form of correctness. This is a lot of extra effort, but I think it's worth it to get a really, really precise and well-implemented tool. And now, we get to kind of talk about my favorite, speed is needed at any cost. So like, Earlier, we saw that Go format executes in 25 milliseconds, even on like very large files. And the question then becomes, like, how does that compare with Ruby? To give you some idea of what saving in 25 milliseconds looks like, this is currently uh, frozen, but if I play the video, can you even notice the 25 millisecond delay that I put in there when I'm saving the file? Like, there is a 25 millisecond pause happening there. No one can see it. So the question, really for a tool like this is how fast is fast enough? And this then becomes a discussion of like execution speed. Well, basically the fastest any program can meaningfully execute in this context is 16 milliseconds. The display on your laptop is refreshing 60 times a second, that's a 16 millisecond delay. If I can be faster than that, I'm done, but even like two or three screen refreshes, almost zero humans can notice. Most of the interactivity design research says that if you take longer than 100 milliseconds, most people will be able to notice, and that can be really painful and break people's workflows, especially 
uh, Vim users in the room, most of you are doing your interactions after save in less than 100 milliseconds because you're not actually watching what the screen does. So my current goal is to get Ruby format to be able to execute uh, in less than 100 milliseconds on a 3,000 line Ruby file. Uh, this, when I went through the source code of Rails and RSpec, this seemed to be about the largest files that were there. Um, I know in your apps, some of you have files called user.rb that are bigger than that. <laughs> um, but like this, we have to set the limit somewhere. Um, so the absolute fastest you can do anything with Ruby is this command, uh, Ruby hyphen hyphen disable equal gems uh, e empty string. Uh, so by default, when you start up Ruby, it will load a bunch of Ruby gems related information. Passing this disable gems flag tells it not to do that, and then e empty string is just saying evaluate no code. On my uh, latest edition 13 inch MacBook, that command takes 25 milliseconds to execute or about two screen refreshes. If you turn gems on, so just Ruby evaluate empty string uh, with no code, uh, it takes about 75 milliseconds. And so this is telling me basically that like we can't run the parser and format a 3,000 line file in 25 milliseconds. There's just no way. So Ruby format can't use gems. Like, we just have this fundamental restriction where to build this program, we cannot use Ruby gems. Uh, again, speed is needed at any cost because this is in people's interactivity loops. I want to show you one more time scale. This is 800 milliseconds, and the boxes here represent the same time units as the colors they did previously. Would anyone like to hazard a guess at, at what doing bundle exec any command ta takes? Um, so if you measure this, just booting bundle exec Ruby empty string takes 425 milliseconds. So that's four times our like, time budget already. So we absolutely, definitely can't use Bundler. And just to sort of show you uh, what this looks like, uh, this was actually taken by measuring against bundle exec Rubicop on a four line file. I like, wanted to just see, like, is there anything we could do where we can sort of like, inherit from Rubicop or pull Rubicop in as a gem or extract parts of it? And, the answer is just no. Um, while Rubicop has a bunch of cool internal libraries for dealing with Ruby source code, I just can't imagine a way in which that would ever be fast enough. And this is not supposed to be like a dunk on Rubicop. Rubicop is designed to be a completely different class of tool. So the question is like, where am I today? Like, right, I've just been talking to you for a while about why I'm building this and how I'm building it. So we actually completed an implementation of Ruby format entirely in Ruby that can read in a file, generate a Ruby parse tree, uh, generate an internal sort of like queue-like representation, and then serialize it back out to a source code file. And like, I was so happy on that day. Like, there is something like 200 uh, files in the Ruby format repo, which are all just like weird arcane Ruby syntax to make sure we are compatible with everything. Uh, one of them, I actually sent a bug report to the Stripe folks because it broke the Sorbet parser. Um, recursive here docs are a thing. Uh, there's like three people in this room who get that joke and they know why I'm sad now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, here's where we're at today. Uh, this file is 186 lines. The pure Ruby implementation takes about 106 milliseconds to execute. On a larger file, 187, and on that sort of like 2,000 line file, 415. We're too slow. Ruby format, the, Ruby, the pure Ruby version just is not fast enough. I um, threw profilers at this. I did every optimization I could think of. I did GC tuning. This just wasn't gonna happen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Rubies we have today 
are not fast enough to build a Ruby formatter, which is kind of sad. I really wanted to be able to say I built a pure Ruby Ruby formatter. That would have been super cool. Um, so what do we do? Well, when you want to go really fast these days, there's really one language that everyone's talking about. It's Rust. Uh, and so I started rewriting pieces of the Ruby formatter in Rust. Earlier, I talked a little bit about Ripper, which is the library built on top of a file within Ruby called parse.y. Parse.y is written in a language called uh, Yak and is the tool that Ruby uses to generate its own parser. The problem is that the Yak code in parse.y can't really be separated from the Ruby interpreter. There's no easy mechanism for us to just invoke the parser from a Rust program. If I could just write all of this in pure Rust, I would be like very done, but that's also not possible. So Ruby and Rust working together in perfect harmony. Um, what I have today is a Ruby program which reads your source code, generates a parse tree, and then converts it to JSON. This, by the way, is the official logo of JSON. Um, that JSON tree is then sent into a Rust program, which is generated as a Ruby native extension. Uh, the Rust program then converts that JSON into a parse tree, generates that intermediate representation, and serializes out the file. Um, it's so fast. Oh my god. Um, the basic difference is that um, the Rust program has a completely type safe specification of the Ruby parse tree. Uh, and so it's able to do like static and not dynamic dispatch to do all the formatting. Uh, it's really, really fast. Uh, the, initial, the initial test suggests uh, this will be able to blow through the 3,000 line files, no problem. I, my life now is uh, building tooling in Rust to work with Ruby source code. Uh, I have intent, uh, once I'm done with this sort of first pass, um, to begin pulling the parser entirely into Rust. Uh, I don't know how achievable that is on any kind of reasonable time scale, and it's why I'm doing it last and not first. Um, so let's summarize. Uh, when I'm building many pieces of software, I tend to hold uh, some of these principles in my head, but in particular for building Ruby format, these things are so important. It just will not be good. People will not want to use it uh, if it doesn't do all of these things. But like, these imply so much work. Like, I'm doing so much work to get this done. It's a really, really hard piece of software to build. In fact, like, I genuinely think this might be the most technically complex piece of software I've ever built and I include like all of the distributed system nonsense I did when I worked at DigitalOcean. Um, this is, it's super cool. It like, it really, really motivates me. Um, I am spending a lot of time sweating the details and trying to get this right. I think um, many folks outside of Ruby say that like us not having an auto formatter is kind of us missing table stakes uh, these days and I, think we can solve this problem. Um, I genuinely and legitimately want to say thank you to the Rubocop and Sorbet teams. Like, they have already built fantastic examples of Ruby developer tooling and proved that there's appetite for like this kind of thing. And frankly, without the existence of these two, I probably wouldn't know if I could build and pull this off. Uh, so where can you get the code? Uh, the code is github.com, Penelope's own Ruby format. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much.